Good morning. Uh, this is the 20 year anniversary of the first doctoral management or EPA program of its kind in the world. And we are celebrating it as an important innovation as a sort of harbinger and uh, pathbreaker of a new type of uh, management education as a and as a way to build practice in a scholarship community. We are a very unusual and competent and interesting crowd. And we are going to have a very nice two days and exciting two days to discuss the topics, to make new friends and to <laughs> meet old friends and to be part of a build building a community. And great to see you all, uh, old friends, and I hope some new friends. But we're, um, we're excited to be here, and we're excited to share some thoughts with you. Our goal today is to excite, invigorate, engage, um, and, and share with you a world of ideas. Uh, in short, we want, what we want to do is replicate the DM experience. We want you back in the seminar rooms where uh, we worked so well together in the past. The format today is I'm going to moderate the group. Um, by, and my, so my first goal is to, is to suggest a framework through which we might think about what the information we're going to have and the way we understand the world. So I'll do a little framing. This is not my framework. It's our framework because we've had a couple of phone conversations in which this has evolved. And then each of the panelists is going to talk for a few minutes about their, their, the, the crisis in globalization that they see or the challenges in globalization that they see, uh, trying to work within the framework that I'm going to present. And then we're going to turn it over to you. We're going to ask you to help us understand other aspects of globalization that um, mm. are relevant to you or relevant to your world, to bring in more information. And then to wrap it up, we're going to try to put our arms around the revised model of how the world is and how the <coughs> world works. Uh, and we're going to get out of here by 10.15. <laughs> so I'm uh, real pleased to start. What we, the challenge we face is how do we understand transformative leadership in the context of globalization? When you think of it, it's not hard. Um, and Rob gave us the clue. We, we're not going to think about transformative leadership that works. We're going to think about transformative leadership that doesn't work and why it doesn't work. And here's the model I want to start with. If you think about a decision maker, so you think about a leader, and it can be an institution or it can be a person, then we understand that the leader has a decision space. The leader makes decisions within a certain space and therefore the leader looks at relevant factors, or as you understand it, um, the, the interest groups that are relevant to the decision, the stakeholders in the decision. And, and even at, 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 the, at the institutional level, this works <coughs> very well. And as long as the relevant <coughs> factors, the relevant decisions are all within the purview of the leader, of the decision maker, then all the leader has to do is meld the various interests together and make good decisions. In which case, we don't need transformative leadership, we just need good decision making. <clears throat> the problem is, the leader's decision space or the leader's purview or the institutional decision space may not include all of the factors that are really relevant to the decision. In that case, there's another world out there of other factors. In which case, the, what, what our model suggests is in order to make good decisions, the leader has to reconceptualize the relevant factors to include a broader area. And transformative leadership is the ability to say my decision space is defined too narrowly, and what I need to do is define my deci deci decision space more broadly to take into, other, take into account other relevant factors. So we're, we're looking at transformative leadership as a, a leader who can understand a broader vision of the factors that are relevant to the decision and take them into account and convince the stakeholders that those are relevant. Now, you can see how this relates to globalization because if you were in my class, we started with boxes and we're not getting far away. This is the nation state. And we know that the central problem of globalization is that the decisions that relate to 
the policy adopted in any box have spillover effects into the other boxes so that the, the decision space in any country, Ghana or the United States, is, uh, does not take into account all the relevant factors. China devalues and the world shudders. Um, so that China is not taking into account the, relevant, the factors that, are, that would be relevant to um, human well-being. And tra what transformative leadership does is say, OK, how do we make decisions <coughs> within the boxes that take into account more relevant factors? So we start with the UN. And then we say, well, wait a minute. That's not working because the UN is tied to the boxes. So they're not taking into account relevant factors. Uh, and then we say, well, then maybe, we ought, maybe NGOs will move in. And they will say, there are relevant factors you're not taking into account. And they will begin to transform across borders so that relevant factors are taken into account. Now, we have to, I th we're starting with the premise that relevant factors relate to human well-being. <clears throat> if the world gets better because of decisions, then the, decision, the transformative leader has taken into account relevant factors. If the world gets worse, then the leader probably has not or has made a bad decision. Um, so this is our framework. We want to see in to what extent the crises in globalization result from the fact that our leaders are thinking too narrowly. They're thinking too much. Um, they're focused too much on factors that are relevant to sustaining their power but are not relevant to making the world a better place. And then we're going to be looking for instances in which uh, the world has succeeded in transforming itself um, by, by institutional or individual leadership so that a wider range of factors is taken into account. And now the EDM method is to make this very practical. Take the refugee crisis in Europe. It was an Italian problem. And then the Italian said, no, it's not an Italian problem. It's a European problem. And then the European said, no, it's not a European problem. It's an international problem. And finally, Obama said, OK, it's an international problem. So we have this collective action problem, right, John? Um, <laughs> in which I knew that. <laughs> I knew that. Um, in which the, wor the leaders of the world are trying to be transformative by redefining the, the <clears throat> decisional domain so that everybody shares the burden and benefits of refugees. And um, to the extent that that the collective action problem has worked out successfully, the world would be better off. To the extent that we remain in our little boxes and say, not in my country, not in my backyard, the world would be worse off. We need transformative leadership to align the decision-making focus of the leader with the relevant factors that the leader ought to be taking into account. And that's what transformative leadership does. Now, this is our framework. We're now going to go to some particular issues that our, that, that our panelists bring to us. After we get those on the board, and I may just stay up here and write some things down, um, we're going to hear from you. What other perceptions or ideas or changes do you want to make, either in our model or its application? And then we're going to have a free-for-all, uh, so that by 10, by 10, 15, we have reorganized the world. 9.15. Oh, no, because we started at 8. 9.15. <laughs> I always want more time. Um, so by 9.15, we may have a different way of thinking about uh, transformative leadership in the global context and a different way of understanding our position <coughs> with respect to international crises. Uh, you know Eileen Doherty, professor at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, here from the beginning, right? No, I started in 1997, class okay. of 2000. So. Well, she's my role model. Oh, stop. So, Eileen, thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, so happy to be here. Um, and uh, what I'm going to try to do is take what Peter just said, the, the, the individual boxes, which I sort of think is the old model of thinking about international relations, and see if we can get some intellectual traction around how we can at least start to think about or talk about um, new ways of thinking about transformative leadership. So um, I, as I was driving in, I was thinking about the fact that this is the 20th anniversary of the DM program, EDM program for some of us. Um, so let's go back. How, how many people here were here the first year, the inaugural class, class of 1998, right? So here I am driving in, thinking about what the world was like 
in the first inaugural class of the EDM program. The year was 1995. You were sitting in a room in Dively talking about um, really important things. And you know, right around residency four of the inaugural year, global leaders gathered in Dayton, Ohio in order to sign the Dayton Accords to end this horrible four-year war in Bosnia. And it was not a triumph of transformative leadership. It was almost a limping to the end, right? We had, it ended a war that had seen non-state actors, that had seen rape as a method of war, that had seen identity conflict, that had seen the, the, the globalization of conflict, um, that had seen ethnic cleansing, new words, um, new phrases, and what seemed like a failure of the United Nations and global leaders to deal with it until the conflict had pretty much played itself out. Not a great moment. A year before that, we had seen an 800,000 people genocide in Rwanda in 1994. Not a great moment for international relations. A little bit before that, we started to use the term failed state for the first time, um, in my experience at least. States that weren't able <coughs> to deal with the conflicts inside their borders. So when you were starting the DM program, it was not a great time for international relations. Um, it was a pretty crummy time. And one could argue that it hasn't gotten much better and that maybe it's gotten worse. And I actually think that, that that's probably right. All of the things that we saw in 95 are still there and maybe more so. All right, the globalization of conflict, the globalization of, of, of people's uh, movements, the, um, the role of non-state actors. Right? So how far have we gotten in dealing with that? How, what, what has happened in the international community to try to understand what has changed and how we understand moving beyond these failures to potentially framing discussions for solutions. And I don't, uh, we don't have solutions, but let me throw out three quick points about the ways in which we can start to think about these things a little bit differently that I think are, are worth thinking about. Number one is the question of security. All right, Peter put these boxes on the board, the old state model, the UN model, right? For, for most of our lives, security was, for most of modern history, security has been de deemed to be state security. Right? The security of states, the security of state boundaries. Starting in the 1990s and in the last 20 years since we've been uh, together as a community, um, more and more people are talking about what if we think about security putting human beings at the center? Right? Particularly if we have a world where non-state actors are more important and globalization of conflict. What if human beings are at the better? We call it human security. This is not Doherty Sill talking. This is, this, is, this is a concept that's really worth thinking about. And what that would mean is if to think about international security, you think about a human being and what he or she needs. And he or she needs not just not to be the victim of war. They need environmental security. They need food security. They need shelter. And what that does is to bring together the problems in the experience, the dignity, the life, the security of an individual human being, human security. I would suggest that if we do that, it transforms not just the way we think about security, but it transforms the way we think about problems and the interconnectedness of problems. And that brings me to point two. Right. I think more and more leaders are agreeing, policymakers are agreeing that, that, that problems are much more interconnected than they have been treated in this nice box world that Peter laid out. Right. Um, that it, old institutions and old solutions don't work, either organizationally or conceptually. And an example that the four of us were talking about on the phone was the example of the United Nations, which was created in 1945. By the way, happy 70th birthday, United <laughs> Nations. Um, and it was, it was organized around three pods, three issue areas, international peace and security, international development, and international human rights. And that made sense, except that it evolved to be separate conceptual problems, separate organizational silos. And more and more, and Aubrey can speak much more about this than I can, but more and more, people are recognizing that that makes no sense. That if you're working on development, you have to talk to the human rights people. And if you're working on development, it has things to do with, with uh, security. And so um, Peter mentioned the European refugee problem, right? I mean, what is that? Is that a security issue? Of course. Is it a development issue? Of course. Is it a human rights issue? Of course. So it's not just a question of whether it's a domestic, an Italian problem, or a German problem, an international problem. We have to think about the interconnectedness of problems themselves. How we're going to do that is hard. And Aubrey was going to talk, I think, a little bit about the development goals um, and the development debates in the United Nations and, and some of the frustrations 
in the policymaking world have been the ways in which those silos have kept those d discussions different. So if you look at questions of, let's say, women in development, you're talking to different people than you are if you're talking about women's human rights. And that should not be, right? That should not be. How we change that is a question. Last point, and then I'll turn it over to Aubrey. Um, I, I think, you know, what does this imply for leadership? What does this imply for you, for us, as transformative leaders? Um, I, I think that uh, it, it implies the responsibility of looking beyond what we think of as not just our domain of influence in terms of stakeholders, but in terms of the problems and the, and the consequences we're going to have. And an example of that is the, the, um, the United Nations Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights, which were accepted formally in 2011, pretty recently. 2011. Those guiding principles, um, a key point of that is this. It is that if a business is going to make a sustained engagement in another country, part of its due diligence must be risk analysis for sure, but not just financial risk analysis, political risk analysis. There ought to be human rights risk analysis. And what that means is looking at the impact that you will have on the people on the ground, not just that you're dealing with, but other people. Down, downstream effects. What might happen? I think that's a good start. And it's a movement away from the old debates about, well, we should just have some kind of treaty articulating what business human rights are, what the business responsibilities are to human rights. What it says is that it's different in each domain. It's different in each business deal. It's different. And you are obligated to think about this particular instance and what it implies, and what it implies for the stakeholders, what it implies for the connectedness of issues. Right? And um, that's in writing in the business, the guiding principles on human rights. As I read that and think about it, it reminds me of the collective action class. Nice, nice ending, right? Because everything's a collective action <laughs> problem. But um, one of, uh, uh, many of you took collective action with different people, some with John, some with me, some with other people, um, with, with Mohan. And a lot of you read um, Garrett Hardin's Filters Against Folly. Remember that? Sort of, yeah. I stole it from John, by the way. I'd never read it. I saw it on his syllabus. I thought it must be good, and I assigned it. Um, but one of the things that Garrett Hardin says is he reminds us that he's an ecologist. And I pulled a quote that has stayed with me for, for, for 20 years, or 17 years, or however long I've, it's been. He says, of every well-meant proposal, he says, we have to think about unintended consequences. Of every well-meant proposal, ecologists ask a standard question, and then what? I would say, of every well-meant proposal, transformative leaders must ask a standard question, and then what? I'm done. Uh, Hard act to follow. <laughs> good morning. Good morning. Uh, no. Your Excellency, good morning. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Good morning. It, it, it is really good to be back. I have, I'm, I'm from the class of 2002, and my colleague, I think my only colleague from that class who is here is Bart Morrison. And Bart is a much more of a regular coming back than I have been. And, but it's, it's great to be in the company of all of these, these wonderful people and great learned leaders, many of whom I, my, I learned from so much, Peter, John, Eileen, and others who may be here. It's, it's wonderful. Um, following on Eileen's, present, Eileen's presentation, there's, uh, there's a lot to follow on. And collective action does take the stage in many ways. Let me, let me be a little bit more positive, having spent the last 10 months in the Hall of the United Nations, <laughs> and talk a little bit about some of the successes. Next Sunday, we celebrate 20 years on Beijing. So when this program was started in 1995, the international community had turned a major focus onto women. And we celebrate 20 years of Beijing and the progress made since then. Um, next Sunday, next Sunday at the United Nations, there's a big event celebrating that 20 years and with leaders speaking about progress made. And we have, while there is a significant to, lot to be done, while there have been atrocities around using, especially in wars, using rape and so on, 
we have made strides that we did not foresee 20 years ago. The, the United Nations, the, um, the, the, the Human Rights Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability is another achievement that the world have made since then. An achievement where in 1995, we were just coming out of what was called the standard rules on persons with disability. We had just developed that. That was approved in, 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 in Denmark. And we moved on from that to develop a rights charter that now sees significant movement, that now sees in the United Nations for the first time a small island like Antigua taking the lead to appoint the first person with disability as an ambassador to the United Nations in any, in, in, in anywhere in the world. And it is only because of those instruments that came into play. How do we address, though, the big challenges of the world first? I think there is a disconnect. I think there is a disconnect at times between the instruments that we have put in place, the United Nations, the World Bank, the IMF, and so on, and nation states leadership. Now, that's, that's, that's maybe very controversial to say and maybe difficult for even leaders to hear. But while, they, while you work and develop, develop programs, develop policies in the United Nations, very often nation states are challenged with things that are Related, but the leaders have to deal with things more day to day that sometimes I wonder if the connection between the two truly rings out to the leadership in countries. Um, that, uh, we, we see in, in this country, we see the challenge in, 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 in Congress as it relates to things around the United Nations. We, the United States, have not ratified the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability. You tell me why? I don't know. But it, but, it, but it says that there is a disconnect because our leadership is not recognizing the things that we as a global institution says should happen. So, in, so <clears throat> um, 15 years ago, we developed the MGDs, Millennium Development Goals, as the international um, collective action instrument. The MGDs, uh, and the lofty goals we had in the MGDs, some, to some extent, and largely, I would say, had failed us. So what do we do? We came back, and next weekend, the next Friday, at the halls of the United Nations, we are going to develop the SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals. The Sustainable Development Goals tries to pull the three things together that Eileen referenced. People, and that is the rights of individuals, the environment, that is climate and climate change, and peace and security. And those three things now are being pulled together based on the fact that we, we know that in order to transform the world, transform the peoples of the world, you have to get those three, not as silos, but together. The development plan outlaid in the SDGs is, is, a, is, is all embracing. It's very broad. But to, and to get countries to agree on something like that, that focuses on those three tenets of the UN, is, 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 is a major achievement. And is, is our new challenge going forward through 2030. To get leaders, though, to bring that down to the to national or state level, is, is going to be the real challenge in terms of implementation of those processes. Linking what is a human rights challenge into development, because there, there has been that, ma that debate that human rights and development cannot be separated. That development is a right, a human right. Mm. And in many, uh, many, many debates that I have sat in, many countries have refused to accept that and for, to, to link that. However, within the SDGs, it's now a claiming the right. Of, of course, some would say it didn't, it, it didn't get as much prominence. Well, it depends where you're speaking from. 
but it is a reality that we have to link development with rights, and we have to link security with development. And bringing those together is critical. We came out of a discussion trying to, to look at how the United Nations might address the question of, of arms trade. And I, I, I myself was involved in that discussion within the last month. And looking at the, the countries that, that, arms, that the whole arms trade affects negatively most are uh, smaller countries, developing countries. If you excluded Africa, our region, Latin America and the Caribbean region, is probably the most significantly affected country in the small arms trade around the world. Our homicide rate in Latin America and some of the Caribbean is astronomical as a result of illegal arms. And the question that national leaders face is, what do we do about it? When it, that goes to the United Nations as a debate, then that becomes a broader, a broader set of contingencies and something that country that struggle with. I give you a simple example. We tried to get to make the headquarters for arms trade to be Trinidad and Tobago because it's right in the smack bang, the middle of the of, of where this thing takes place and affects people on the ground. We lost. It went to Europe because they had better facilities. The world is still struggling and making decisions around facilities that the old world had and accommodation. We still are not recognizing that as technology is, can be and, and is the driver, that there's still a massive gap, that 57% of the world's population still has very limited access to the internet. And, that fifth, and the majority of those people live in developing countries. Until we implement the driving forces within the SDGs that, that begins to address technology shift, that begins to address development shift, that begins to address funding, we are not going to. National nation states are going to continue to struggle with, international, interna with the international agenda vis-a-vis the underground issues. I want to spend two minutes to talk about how that affects small island states, what they're calling SIDS. <laughs> really? <laughs> the small island states running from Antigua Barbuda and others that are smaller in the UN through to countries like Singapore, one of the big um, supporters of small island states because they're kind of not, 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 not small enough to be a small island, but not big enough to be a big country is New Zealand, a country that really provides a lot of technical support. Um, <coughs> SIDS in the Caribbean in particular find ourselves in a very unique situation. Because of the success of our development, we are now classified, almost every Caribbean island is classified as a middle income country. What that means is that those countries are denied access to the continued funding that they need to promote and develop their services and themselves and their social development. And therefore, as I have said at the UN, they are in the danger of going back into underdevelopment as a result of the policies of the countries or opening themselves at the national level to sharks loan sharks, and the corporate world, which you're seeing every day. So to, we have to find that balance that, re, that recognizes the universality in development and the differences between countries in the, in the, in the mode of development. That's where the SDGs and the collective action around the United Nations um, agenda is going to be and has to be effective. That is where we have to use. What the United Nations does do, however, I'll close uh, uh, two things. One, regardless to size, and I had, um, I had this discussion with a, colleague, with, a, with a friend, that regardless to size, we all have, it's, it's a very democratic institution. We all have one vote. You could be America, <laughs> you could be China, you could be whatever. You have one vote. Now, if you are the Caribbean, you have one vote, but there are 15 of you. 
Mm. So you have 15 collective voices that the Caribbean community carries a lot more punch than the size of the nation and its people because it's the democracy of the United Nations. That, I think, is very useful. The balance there, of course, that you have to you, you watch is the, is the juggle again between the voice in the United Nations and the underground leadership challenges at the nation state. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. And Jalen Newton, the great class of 06. 06. 06. One of the great ones. <laughs> we would like to think so. <laughs> so good morning. Um, the DM program was conceptualized as a practitioner scholar program. And so I think on this panel, I am going to wear more distinctly the practitioner um, hat. And when I was invited or elected to this panel and Peter put forward the, the concept of what we would be talking about, my mind was immediately drawn to the challenges of the corporate world because that's where I spent more than three decades of my life. And so as we started to talk about these big challenges, these big issues of transformative leadership, my thinking was around how this fits with the, the world of corporations. And not in the way that you would think, because I think too often when we think of transformative leadership at the corporate level, we think about how does the company do better in terms of product development, marketing, um, profits for the shareholders. But we're here today talking about this issue in a more global context, in a, in a world context. And so how do corporations fit into this paradigm? Because we've talked about nation states, I think corporations are interesting because we've drawn the box that says this is the nation state and it has a border. And quite interestingly, when we start to talk about corporations, we now erase the border line because corporations are quite, quite unique entities. So the word corporation comes from the Latin corpus, which means body, and I think most of us know corporations take on the life of a citizen. They, they become an individual entity distinct from the people running it. Corporation has a life of its own. And quite interestingly, I think about this because as a US citizen, when I go and work offshore, I can't escape US taxation. The US has a wonderful law by which you get to be taxed, both by wherever you happen to reside, but also you get to send your money back to the mothership. Well, corporations um, have the unique advantage, and it's become quite an interesting um, situation recently, in which corporations are increasingly using tax inversion strategies to move themselves to other domains. And this is something that is, is quite unique. And as we think about corporations, um, I've always been struck by the fact that, and, and we, in Bo's class, I think we, we talked about this, you know, the modern corporate entity is quite a new phenomenon, and yet it's become so entrenched and so much a part of our lives. And yet, you know, as I, as I did a little research on this, I think the first recorded corporation was around 1300 in Sweden. Um, but these early corporations were more governmental entities. It wasn't until really around the 1600s that we started to see the formation of commercial corporations. One of the, the North American first corporations was the Hudson Bay Trading Company. But it wasn't really until the, the Industrial Revolution where we saw, saw the mobilization of resources, capital, human and financial, into corporate entities. And that's when corporate entities started to become such a pervasive factor in our lives. And you know, in the US now, our healthcare system is predicated on corporations. It's an employer-based healthcare system, even though we're shifting away from that. But you know, so I wanted to think a little bit about how the corporate world fits into this. And when you think about it, it is quite important because let's take, um, just as an example, Apple, because I think it's been on all our minds this week as they launched their latest and greatest iteration. Um, so Apple is number five on the revenue list of the Fortune 500. Well, if I look at the profit of <coughs> Apple, the profit of Apple would put it at the 89th economy on a GDP basis, a single corporation, 89th. If I look at the market cap, they would be 20th in ranking on GDP. 
single corporation. And so if we think about the Fortune 500 or the Global 500, you start to see that we're talking about you know, a tremendous amount of economic power. And yet, as we think about these larger problems, we've got a very important actor in this discussion that really is focused on a very limited constituency with some highly um, individualized decision domain or factors. And they really are, for the most part, thinking about shareholder, shareholder value, shareholder return. Now, obviously, we've seen that change over the last years. Corporations have been forced, partly in order to continue to be successful in meeting the shareholder demands, they have had to become more socially conscious. But there still is an issue that they are acting and creating, as, as Eileen talked about, you know, these what-if questions, these unintended consequences. And so when my former corporation in California this year was acquired by an Irish company, and the strategy was partly around creating shareholder value by moving the tax base to Ireland. Well, that corporation in California in the last six months has lost 2,000 employees. So in that community, 2,000 employees is quite a significant impact on the community not to mention the loss of tax revenue to both the US, California, and the local communities. And so these decisions that are being taken, as Peter talked about, this domain of other factors in the corporate world is often not particularly considered. There are other areas in which um, we talk about immigration. There's an immigration issue that corporations participate in, and that is in terms of moving production to, to low wage states, also, they have an impact in terms of, you know, in Silicon Valley, this, this whole issue of the H-1B visa is very important because they're trying to bring in talent from outside the U.S., partly because we have some failures in our own science and math education programs. And they're bringing in this talent from outside. So there are consequences not only to the local communities and potentially to our own educational systems, there's also the hollowing out that that creates in other markets where this talent is being drawn to the US. The issue of call centers in India where you've got corporations coming over there and paying wages and giving benefits that are quite superior to what local firms provide. So we have a whole host of challenges here. And you know the real issue here is the constituents constituency or the, the leaderships that we're talking about really in the grand scheme of things is quite small and it's also quite a biased population. So if you think about the senior leadership teams and the board of directors of the 500 largest U.S. corporations, what does that domain look like? Who do those leaders look like? And you know, sadly it's primarily white males. So we, we have a whole host of issues in the corporate world and you know, the question is, where do they fit into the dialogue? You know, they're not sitting in the UN. The corporations are not represented, although Aubrey mentions that corporations have, you know, an impact on the issues that the UN is trying to drive. Now, we have seen, I think, some interesting um, changes. We, we now see the Davos Economic Forum, where I think you see more engagement on the part of corporate leaders to have a voice and participate in some of the, the challenges that the world is facing. But as Eileen said, I think the issue here is we certainly, and we've had some really lively discussion in our phone calls, there are really no answers here. And I think that's one of the, the fun things about the DM program that we all learned is that there are more questions. The, the more you look, there are more questions than answers. And I think we can't have this discussion around these global challenges without considering the impact and the implications <laughs> that corporations have on the decision domain and the policy setting domain, and how do we factor those in? Because you know, at the same time we, we can make inroads at the nation state level, corporations can pick up and move tomorrow and change things overnight. And so they operate with a unique power and privilege that's important to consider as we have these discussions. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> to me, the hallmark of the EDM or the DM program is we don't talk at you, we talk with you. Um, and so in our remaining hour and 15 minutes, <laughs> um, 
I, well, we want to hear from you. Um, what, what I see is two ways of looking at the world. One is based on the nation state, the real politic, the fact that things don't get done unless the nation states want them to get done. Um, with a corporation sort of cutting across the nation state and ruining their ability to, to control. I mean, if all, if all the corporations were within the political boundaries, then it'd be fine. We could regulate corporations, get what we want. And then I see Eileen's model, or her model says, let's look at the individual and reason from there. <clears throat> and the question that raises is, if you put the individual at center, how do you define the individual's welfare, and how do you get the welfare? That is, how do you understand the, um, the institutions we need in order to bring about welfare change, when in fact we do so much through the nation state? Yes? With all due respect to the yes. panel, I think you guys missed something. No? I'm sure we did. That's why you're here. <laughs> That's why you're here. <laughs> all the way through everyone's comments, uh -huh. the one thing that struck me is I was trying to think of examples where of good leadership or excellent leadership that I've seen. And there's a, a third circle or a different box or a different perspective, which is the management of unknown factors. Uh -huh. and yeah, you know, what you've described up here to me is much more management. Identifying gaps, gap reduction, yeah, you know, what are the right decisions, how do we play one thing off against another, or how do we balance things? But when I think about excellent leadership, the demonstration of that is building protocols that are designed for incompleteness, that capture things that no one knows so that they can evolve and adjust. And it's very hard to provide a specific example because when something shifts from the unknown to the known, it becomes hard to believe of a time when we didn't know that. But that's the, you know, these ideas of gap reductions and the Millennium Development Goals and the shift to the Sustainable Development Goals, there are a lot of people who are concerned that we're going to lose a tremendous amount of momentum when that happens because so many people are fighting to become relevant and saying, my gap is the most important gap that needs to be reduced. But what we really need with that process is a way to understand how do we handle a situation like it's happening in Syria right now, or what's happening with ISIS, and say, all right, how do we build a protocol that protects human rights for something like that? What's the next version? What's worse than IS and what they're doing? Because it's going to happen. No one thought there could be anything worse than Al-Qaeda, and we found out, <laughs> oh yeah, there is. So th that's something that I've been struggling with with everyone's uh, components, is how do you manage the unknown? How do you build an environment where people are empowered to make change to things that we don't even see coming, because that's leadership from my perspective. Well, shut up. Uh, it's absolutely right. Um, the, the uncertainty uh, and the unknown. So all your, like, what you're asking is, given uncertainty and unknowingness, do these, either reasoning from the individual or reasoning from the boxes, does it work, right? Because if the box is, so you're asking, so what you want me to do is put unknown in here and bring it over into the decision space of whoever's making the decision and see what happens. Yeah, that's good, yeah. Mine's more of a request. Um, since we're kind of getting acquainted with people that we don't know, if uh, we could introduce ourselves and just maybe say the class as we're speaking. Yes. I think that would be helpful. Great idea. I'm John Pullman, by the way, class program. Other crises, other, yes. I yeah. Just a comment which relates to the sort of one idea of the DM programs, which is the importance of evidence uh -huh. and rigorous evidence. Like if you look at the many of the global problems of climate change, uh, human rights issues, and many other things, there's an enormous amount of evidence that, uh, that uh, for all of these, there are impacts on the social development or that uh, th these threats exist. But uh, because maybe of the institutional complexity, there's very little ways of really uh, using that evidence in the ways which leads to effective action. It's, so it's a different type of collective action. We know what, it, what should be done. We have the evidence, but still we, we are sort of inert, stymied. And may I interpret that comment to say that 
evidence mm. lies outside the decision space yes. and it is interpreted by people inside the decision space and how they interpret it. So do you, can you say any comment on that or uh, how you sort of see that or sort of just in this context totally disqualify the importance of evidence? But my comment is, yes, we decide what we want to do and then look at the evidence and make it fit what we want to do. So if we don't want to address climate change, we, we, we don't look at the data. Um, so that our decision space is so narrow that we look to the answer rather than to the evidence. But isn't that the dilemma between, well, I said, the leader at the national or nation state level vis-a-vis the broader institutional information that, that gets, because the leader makes decisions not necessarily based on the evidence that he, get, he or she gets from institutions. They make decisions based on whatever that political or nation dilemma is. And, and that, to me, is the consistent juggle. It isn't that we don't have information. The SDGs, as an example, has indicators. There are six, 169 um, areas that they look at, and there are several indicators to each of those that are being developed. But Within the nation, we ignore half of those because it doesn't affect or doesn't meet the nation's criteria at that time. I'm not sure. They, I'm, so the ignoring is more deliberate than it is, in my thinking, that is my opinion. <clears throat> Let me go over here. Thank you. Uh, Dave Aaron, I'm on the faculty. Uh, uh, so two comments uh, that, are, that are somewhat related. The discussion has really focused on what uh, Rattel and Weber described as wicked problems mm -hmm. with their interconnectedness. But what it, and critical to the concept of a wicked problem is no one can agree on what the problem is. Mm -hmm. All right. And that, I think, is a key issue that's missing from this discussion. And just to comment on uh, Callie's comment, what constitutes evidence is an extremely contested space. And as a physician, which I am, it is just as bad, if not worse, uh, in medicine as it is anywhere else. I think one of the challenges that Callie brings to light is, is kind of what we started the conversation on, and that is, how you define the leadership domain. And because if I'm a corporation and I'm spewing stuff out into the atmosphere, my evidence is going to be different Correct. than the community's evidence. And so agreeing on the problem and then trying to get, I think, a cohesive view of the evidence is one of the critical challenges that we face as we try to make decisions that cross these boundaries. Yes, David. David Sherman, um, 07. One of the things that just strikes me uh, when, I, when I look at this, and I think across my career, uh, I remember when I did my MBA, uh, we believed in efficient market theory. And now, and at the same time, we, we felt that in economics that people were rational. And now we have behavioral economics and behavioral finance and all of that. And so when we're framing this, we're doing it pretty much in a, in a pretty rational way. But we actually know now with neuroscience and um, a lot of the other sciences that we don't make decisions in rational ways. And I don't know, I don't have an answer for this. I'm just gonna put it in as another comp complicating factor that we actually now know that we make gut decisions and rationalize them afterwards. And there's so many different interests. And then we frame things so much differently. We have selective the way our memories work. We actually remember things differently. We look at things, uh, the same things in different ways. And then I, I remember in Eileen's class uh, when we started to look at just the different mindsets around the world and the different ways that people thought about things. When you take neuroscience into account, it actually complicates that even more. It just brings it to another level. So I just say that, that these on top of our rational frameworks are just more complicating factors that maybe lead to more uncertainty and unintended consequences. And um, the, the, the fact that there really are a lot more unknowns than we like to think. We like to put boxes together and think we have it figured out and then go off and do it. And we usually find that when we do that, something comes out. So I'm gonna say one last thing. And I sit near Silicon Valley and, and, and do a lot of work in that area. 
And the big thing that we do there is experimentation now, you know, and rapid prototyping. So we try things and see what happens and get feedback and do all of that. And so um, that's just another, that, that's one way to deal with chaos and with uncertainty and all of that. So I'll throw that out as another thought. Just so if I could take a stab at linking that to John's comment about ISIS, which I think is a, an example that leaps to a lot of our minds about intractable problems. Um, uh, in, in thinking about different mindsets, one of the ways of thinking about ISIS these days is, 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 that I think is useful is that this is a group of people who are not only fighting for control or fighting for territory, they're fighting for a different vision, right, of statehood. They're fighting for a different vision of legitimacy. And, and it's not like they're fighting for a seat in the UN, right? They have no interest in engaging with the UN. And so one way to think about ISIS is almost equivalent to you know, pre-Westphalian Europe when you had people duking it out to build states, build territory, build, um, build institutions. And so that creates to the wicked problem-ness, which I, I, I like that, that link. Um, it also raises questions of unintended consequences, because even if we could come to an agreement on what to do about ISIS, one of the things we have found is that, look, ISIS European refugees, it's all related to stability in the Middle East. We know that, right? Of course it is. But it's hard to find an intervention in the Middle East that did not have unintended consequences that were more negative than positive. Um, and it, it is hard to know what to do uh, proactively. Uh, I, I'm with you, John. I have no idea what to think, what to think about solutions for this. Yes. So Mike Reeves, uh, class of 2000, uh, I don't so, 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 uh, so I think that in the 40-year reunion, you're going to be talking about the same things because I think that, that, that the, the, the issues are, you know, how many will be here? Uh, <laughs> that that uh, these are sort of intractable problems and that they're human nature problems. and, and it, it, you, you never really want to get out in front of the problem uh, because, quite frankly, ISIS could be eliminated within you know, weeks, if not months, if the, if the world came together and said, look, we don't like this. But we're not going to do that. I mean, it just is not going to happen. And so, so the issue of it is is that we never want to get out in front of the problem until it becomes our problem, whoever the R is in, in, in a particular instance. And if there's no leadership in the, in the world, and the United Nations is clearly not in that category, um, then, it's, then it's really not going to happen. So I, I just sort of see that, that these are interesting discussions, but, but there really isn't a really good solution to that. I'd like to make one comment about the, the evidence thing. Um, I mean, I am not a believer in climate change. I think that the science is fatally flawed in that. And I think that the whole issue of it is is that, that if you don't have real science, i.e., you basically suppress uh, other views, which it seems to be kind of the, the position we take on a lot of things, that I think the, the, the thing that, that we have sort of gotten away from from a liberal society is basically mm -hmm. having uh, opposing views and being able to, to in essence, do that. Uh, and, and I think that, uh, that climate change falls under that category of suppression of uh, opposing views. You know, I think that nobody is going to be in the climate science business uh, will get their doctorate if they don't agree with the the uh, the uh, success of of what that is. So so I think that there there are so, that if we go back. I'm, by the way, I'm saying it could happen, but I think that, that the science is fatally flawed. And I think that goes into a lot of categories of of basically suppressing opposing views and and making these things ideological, and not opening them to a wider uh, perspective of views. And I think by doing that, we basically cause our own problems in the future. Thank you. Yes. Um, one thing I want to note about the concept of leadership. Oh, sorry. Uh, I'm Sally Tom, and I started in the class of, the graduated in 99, so we started in 96, but I finished in 01. Um, and um, I just want to point out that there are folks who think about leadership, primarily Ronnie Heifetz, who talk about the distinction between authority and the exercise of leadership. And when we talk about doing things with the resources we have at our command because we have positions of authority, we might be actually exercising leadership in the sense of pushing on hard issues in a way that makes, makes things better for people. On the other hand, we could be using our positions of authority to make 
bad decisions. And when we call that using authority to make bad decisions leadership, we really muddle the concept a lot, I think. And it's important to note that you can exercise leadership from a position of no authority in society or, the, or an organization. And you can have a ton of authority and really screw things up badly. And I don't think that should ever be called leadership. And so all of our discussion today has been framed around the both the benefit and the liability of thinking about leadership as being totally connected to having a position of authority. And maybe, I, I, hap I happened to sit in yesterday on, um, it was like deja vu all over again, <laughs> Mohan's uh, collective action class where he was leading the students through the discussion of um, Olson and Ostrom and Hardin and thinking, and then realizing he's having them really focus on social movements and how those come about. And to the extent that we think about some of these problems as problems that cannot be solved with authority, have to be solved through social movements, maybe we can reframe how we as people who have positions of authority can help <coughs> social movements happen to solve some of these problems. So let me just add that when I put our NGOs up here, I'm, I can broaden that to social movements. Yeah. And then we have leadership that tries to fill the void of bad leaders or leaders who can't, don't have the right decision frame. May I speak? I have the mic. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Janet Bennett, class of 98. Um, you know, I would like to offer a little different uh, thought. Uh, you know, since we only have a few minutes left to solve the world's problems, we've got to cut to the chase. And I'd like to use the analogy of gardening. Um, it seems to me that what we're really looking at here is a plant with the leaves falling off. And we're never going to get the plant to grow and flourish uh, in, if the root system is bad. And I would like to suggest we have a rotten root system. And the answer to me is you have to get down to the root cause. And I would like to throw out a provocative idea to this group. Good, we welcome that. Which is that our root system, that's the, the issue that's driving our roots in this world today is around the model of scarcity. And I think that's an old and outdated model. And we cling to it and we use competition and greed and everything else that drives that line of thinking. And we have plants that die. I mean, we have a rotten root system and we have leaves falling off around the world. So unless you fix the root system, I don't think we're going to see anything major change. And I think the solution to that, if anybody else is a gardener here, is you start working on the roots. And I would like to recommend or suggest that the answer to that is to switch from a scarcity paradigm to an abundance paradigm. And the way you do that is you work through community. So that's what I would like to offer as a different way of seeing it. And I think then the problem has become manageable because when you're really raking up dead leaves, what do you do? You know, you do feel disheartened. You do feel like you cannot get to the root of the problem. But if we don't shift, and I would like to suggest too that the United States is not doing a good job as a transformative leader because we are driven by a scarcity model around greed. And as long as we are the predominant leader internationally, we are not going to be a transformative leader. So that's my two cents. And who wants to Thank you. stick? Uh, Mike over here, yes. Shawana. Shawana Johnson, class 98. So I would like to build on something Janet said and get back to Eileen. So I, I think we can't abandon a scarcity model, which is completely juxtaposed to my personality, which is all abundance and goodness. But, um, <laughs> however, with that said, <laughs> so, I can't even believe I'm saying that. See, John, what you taught me? Oh my God. <laughs> um, we have to keep both sides of that in check, so scarcity and abundance. And I work in the intelligence community, looking across the globe at global instability in global food supply, water supply, um, energy supply. When people are hungry, they behave badly. When they're thirsty, they behave badly. And when they're hot or cold, they behave badly. And they're going to behave badly. So I agree we have to look at the root cause, but the human in the loop 
always has a tendency to try to solve a problem, the actual applied capability of what we do. So I think, Eileen, you're right on target, but I would say let's not put that human out in its own separate box, because there aren't any boxes anymore. Forget all the circles and boxes, because it's all very messy. Um, social movements, social media, crowdsourcing, even in parts of the world where we say we're not connected, the truth is we are connected. And it's that human that looks at the scarcity and says, uh, I've discovered that there are, is no rice being produced in the biggest rice producing area of Syria. And why? A river upstream got, the dam got blown up because they're trying to star starve them. So we've got to say, we've got to fix that problem today because that rice feeds Iraq. So we've got to get food there to them. And there are great people in the United States doing all those things every single day. There is a huge community of transformative leaders at the working level that fight against the political level every single day to keep these systems moving and to keep people protected and secure and fed. And I think it would be great if politically we would move to more of a look at what the root causes are of everything. But take that human and spread them throughout every single piece of your model because they, therein lies the key. Good, thank you. Yes. It, it seems to me a wrap, Drew Sellers, 2008, it, we're, we're, that in the model, the, if you're trying to develop a model, you, and you get it, this is, you really have to look at misaligned incentives. I mean, so, the, so if you're Donald Trump, you say stupid things because it drives your poll numbers up, right? I mean, whether, right, yeah, well, well or maybe he believes him, but, you know, and so, or, or if you're the United States, or if you're a corporation, or if you're, uh, you know, uh, someone in ISIS, you have misaligned incentives, right? We're not all driving towards the same thing. And so I'm not sure that there's an answer, but when I look at these, uh, these issues, I think the problem is not having, having any agreement at all as to, you know, how we reward behavior or what, re you know, what behavior gets rewarded, whether it's at the individual level or at the nation state level or at the corporation level. So, so somewhere in the model, I think we have to deal with incentives. If we could get more coherent sets of incentives, right, that had uh, rewards associated with them, then people would start no, behaving that way. That's absolutely right. This model was based upon the incentives the leader has to make wise decisions are wrong because the leader's not taking into account what ought to be taking account. But I want to follow up on the idea of focusing on the individual. Um, is it possible? that we get rid of our boxes and just have a collection of people. And then we recognize that some of them are connected and some of them are not. Can I jump in that too? Yeah, I think sure. um, as, as Shawana, right? Um, as Shawana was talking, I was, I was realizing that my remarks made human beings the subject of security, right? And Shawana was saying human beings are the leaders, right? Human beings are the, the, the agents also of security and prosperity and abundance maybe. Um, and I think that's right. I think that's interesting. And I think that um, much of the discussions of leadership do tend to have a top-down model or a top-down kind of approach to thinking about solving problems. But there's a lot to be said for looking for local knowledge and tapping into local knowledge and, and uh, local expertise, whatever form that takes in making these decisions. So th thank you for that. that. I think that's very interesting. Yes, Steve. Uh, Steve Brand, uh, 2004, actually you published. Mean What's that? You mean the mic. Steve Brand from 2004, and actually, it's funny, our defining moment, our defining moment was between our first and our second residency, 9-11 happened. And if you remember, that was pretty defining. But I, I think that all of these conversations are about adults behaving badly. <laughs> <laughs> and every one of these people who are behaving badly were 10 years old at some point. And I think one of our, our missions should be is to really focus on education. And I say education not being formal education, but learning. And I think not just teaching, you know, I think we always, as Americans, we have USAID wants to go into countries and put students in schools and teach them how to read and write and all that. That's fine. But we need to teach, you know, how to think different mindsets, innovation mindsets, collaboration mindsets, how to play nicely. Because I think when we don't focus on that, when they get to this level, 
they're used to playing badly because that's what they don't learn. And also respecting people with differences. And I, I'm, I'm thinking about Silicon Valley where the preponderance of Asperger's is huge. If we look at some of the greatest leaders we have in Silicon Valley, they didn't finish school and a lot of them have Asperger's or some level of that. I think we, we look at people who don't behave in the normal system but learn how to behave in a certain way. You know, I, I was um, reminded and I was thinking about this a guy named John Hunter. I don't know if you know he, wrote the, he runs the World Game Institute. And he works with, um, um, with uh, fifth graders and he teaches them how to deal with world crisis in the simulation game. And of course, Panetta invited all these kids up to the Pentagon to, to provide advice to generals on how to deal with world crises because these kids are learning how to deal with empathy and dealing with, you know, violence and dealing with um, terrorism at an age where they could really understand that it's not just learning the history but actually playing with the ideas and I think if we don't think about that because 10 year olds now have cell phones and are on the internet and they are, their voices are being heard like this kid who's now going to the White House because he created this clock and people thought it was a bomb but look, those kids have a voice and I think if we need to figure out a way in all of these is to realize that all the leaders that are there, and Michelle Sandberg is focusing on this leaning in, how do we teach women and girls how to be, be leaders at a very early age? Um, and how do we teach, teach boys how not to treat girls the way they're used to doing it? I think that's going on and teaching kids how to be innovative and not just in school, but in life. Because school is a box. And I think part time we think about school as the answer, but I think we need to blow that out and say, yeah, school's fine. But as I learned in my research here is that what happens on the outside of school is actually more defining for a child's life than what happens inside of school. We have to understand that and help them play that. The defining moment for these mm -hmm. kids standing at those borders who are refugees, they'll, that'll be in their minds and embedded their whole lives. And what defining moments for kids like 9-11 or night, like, like being a refugee or like you know, being on, like what, what are those defining moments as a child and how does that lead them to be really empathetic, leader oriented and you know and, and 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 serious decision makers as adults whatever world they're in could i just throw two things yes please into, into the mix a little bit one of the things we have not talked about at all in the whole question is power institutions and what that does it, with with the same people that we are saying it a social movement and so on what i have seen and, 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 and never, I, I'm never, uh, I'm always amazed, is people who are social leaders, put them into the formal institution power structures and it transforms them. From being that social leader who advocated for that social thing into the boxes of the, the institution and social and power structure. And that I think we have, we have not yet been able to train and get leaders who can take the community action, um, the community action power that they had, and transform that within a social, within their formal government type institutions, whether it's the UN or in their government structures. That, to my mind, is the hardest nut that we still have to crack. Because I have seen many leaders I have sat with, I have worked with, who were very good social action movement leaders and, and community leaders for change. But once they are covered by the cloak of formal power structures, it's a transformative person and a transformative operation. I have to say the benediction because we're out here the time outside. If, if, if we take the individual as the center of our model, but, and we recognize that a nation state is a collection of individuals, then don't we have to say these individuals within the nation state have different capacities, different backgrounds, different social milieus, some are rich, some are poor, some are outsiders, some are insiders, <clears throat> and that that's true in every, inside every box, but we're getting rid of the boxes. But then we have this group of interconnected people who don't care, like corporations, who don't care about boundaries, uh, who have different capacities and different opportunities, where does that leave the people who are poor? So that we, are we not in danger of having a, a, a world in which we have classes that are horizontal across countries, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer? Anyway, that, it's been very stimulating as always. I'm sorry, we, I'm sorry Rob didn't give us another hour. I tried as hard as I could <laughs> to get it. Um, and Nancy, thank you for organizing this, and thank you all for your participation.